Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Jarrell Mason, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. And today's guest is a man who has been in radio since the late 70s up until around the late 90s. Then he transitioned out of the business to get into the wonderful world of narrations for books, scripts, and various other things. So ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big round of applause and thank you for Mr. Todd McLaren for coming on to Beyond the Album Cover. Welcome. Thank you, Jarrell. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Yes, sir. So how are you doing today? And I appreciate you taking the time out to come on to the podcast. Absolutely. I'm great. Any day vertical is a good day. That's my attitude about life. So. Yes, sir. You got to have an attitude about that. So let's jump right into it. Where were you born sure. and what inspired you to get into the business called radio? Wow. Good questions. Uh, I was actually born in Phoenix, Arizona, but I I have no memory of that. We moved to uh, the East Coast when I was very young because my folks grew up there. And so I was raised in uh, Massachusetts suburban Boston. And then as the family kept growing, growing, my folks kept moving farther away from the city. Uh, so most of my youth was in uh, uh, just south of New Hampshire, uh, out near the coast, beautiful part of the country to grow up in. And then I was, um, I was probably inspired to get into the business by uh, ultimately a guy on uh, WHDH in Boston named Norm Nathan, who was on a a um, kind of a, a middle of the road station back in the 1960s. And he used to do these kind of light comedy bits that I got a kick out of. And I wrote him a letter one day, I was like 13. And uh, I wrote him like a comedy bit. And I used to listen to him after school. No, no Nobody else my age listened to him because uh, everybody else was listening to uh, rock and roll top 40 and, and so forth but he did my bit on the air and from that point i was like hooked then i started writing for him on a fairly regular basis I, i'd send him stuff i don't know once a month and he'd always use it god bless him so i thought gosh i'm getting such a kick out of this uh, i better look into doing this for a living so when it came time to look for colleges i look for um places that had you know broadcast communications departments and um, picked one, got in, and I was off of the races. Right. And I believe, it's, yeah, and I believe where you attended undergrad was that Syracuse University. Yes, sir. And um, ultimately, if I had, if I knew now what I knew then, I probably would have gone someplace else. Syracuse was a massive school and had, oh, golly, probably three times as many undergrads as there were people in my hometown. So, um, but, you know, I made the best of it. But I, in retrospect, I might have gone to Ithaca College in Cornell because they are rather in Ithaca. It's by Cornell. Um, there's a lot, it's a small college, Ithaca, but it is a great place for uh, budding broadcasters to go. And I think the difference between the two um, uh, programs is that what I learned there is that at Syracuse, you you pretty much stuck in the theory of things for the first couple of years. So you took all of your, you know, your background courses, never set foot in the studio. Whereas at Ithaca, you were in the studio from day one. So I knew guys who were as juniors, they got into the television and, and radio studios for the first time decided it, discovered that they hated it. And then they had to change majors after wasting two years of their lives. So, uh, but I, I made the best of it in this, in this way. There was an official Syracuse University FM station. Uh, and they played kind of a free form mix of whatever guys wanted to play on the air. But there were a couple of people uh, who were like 19, 20 years old, serious about broadcasting that put this pirate am station on the air that was very tightly formatted and just played top 40 music and it, it uh you really had to be on the ball as far as running a tight board making sure there was no dead air getting your elements ready in advance and um it was in the basement of a building on campus and i used to go down there like i discovered it 
probably my second week at Syracuse. And I was hanging out there just listening to to them and kind of watching over the the jocks on the air, um, which, honest to God, Jarrell, it was, when I say basement, I mean that the walls were painted like a radio station, but otherwise it was just like a concrete block room. But, you know, they did pretty well with that. And, um, you know, finally just hanging around, enough people said, you know, you want to audition? Yeah, I want to audition. So they put me on the air, gave me a, a you know, like, 10, 15 minute tryout. And um, the program director said, yeah, come on back. We'll have you, you know, go in in this time slot. And we'll just train you as you, as you go. So that was like, it was 1975. Um, and uh, I, I was, I was so dedicated that I said, I'll do as many shifts as you want, whenever you want. And finally they said, you know, nobody wants to do the morning show because it means getting up and signing the station on at 7 a.m. And no college kid wants to get up and out at 7 a.m. So I said, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. How many days? Well, you know, start with three days a week. Okay, so I started with three days a week. Well, pretty soon the person that was supposed to come in Tuesday and Thursday decided they hated it too. So by Christmas time, I was doing radio five days a week from seven to nine in the morning and then going to class. Well, I didn't have any kind of a social life in the evening because I had to be in bed at like nine o'clock. Uh, but I learned so much and I was so far ahead of my peers that um, I got my first like real commercial radio job one summer, uh, just filling in for the for the jocks in um, a little town near where I grew up. Uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and um, uh, I just did summer filling. And then that fall, an opening came up at one of the local Syracuse stations, and I got that job. It was a night job at WFBL. And um, again, I was a junior <clears throat> in college, so I go to class during the day, then I go and play the hits at night. But I guess because of the work at WJPZ, which is the name of the student radio station, the pirate station at the time. Um, and just my love of performing and my, you know, the comedy background that I got from Norm Nathan at WHDH, um, I did really well. And within like three months, I was the number one night guy in town. Man, that's a story. And I tell people this all the time. College radio was definitely a fertile training ground. I got my start in college radio. But the only difference yeah. was where at Syracuse, you had to audition and pretty much had to go through theory before getting into the studio. You were able to go in at my alma mater, University of North Carolina at Greensboro, from day one since it was a student-ran organization. And we were 24 yeah. hours where we had DJs constantly rotating and you had to work your way up from the graveyard shift to the better time slot and since mm -hmm. you said it was 75 when you was at Syracuse was this before Jim Beheim became basketball coach at Syracuse or was this right around oh, when uh, he came in as coach he he began let's see I believe his first year was I gotta think about this now his first year as head coach was my first year at Syracuse. So I think, as I recall, um, I forget the coach's name prior to Beheim. I want to say his name was Roy something because I seem to remember they made it to the final four the year before I got there. And they called them Roy's runs. That's the, you know, that's a, well, something in the back of my mind. So I think Beheim began uh, the same year that I did. And, um, he just he just retired, didn't he? As I recall, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, he just it. stepped down after this season with the ACC tournament. Amazing run at Syracuse, brought a oh, national man. championship in two thousand three with Carmelo Anthony, and just yeah. a legacy. Because when you think of the old school biggies, you think of Bayheim in Syracuse, late John Thompson, Georgetown, Luke Carnesecca yeah. at St. John's, late Roly Massimino right. at Villanova, and just great basketball <laughs> conference, second to the ACC. That's right. Those. those Guys in the Big East, I mean, they they just they went back and forth, and it was a it was just a joy to watch any of those guys coach because they had just great teams and and uh, and great players. I remember um, there was one year where Syracuse 
play of the national championship against, I want to say it was Indiana. And it would have to, had to have been, I don't know, mid eighties sometime. And I was listening. I was, I was working at the time. I was producing voiceover demo tapes uh, with a quite a well-known guy uh, in the voiceover business now, but um, Syracuse was, they were ahead. Honest to God, Jarrell, till the final shot of the game. And Indiana threw up, I don't know if it was a two or a three, went in at the buzzer to win the game for them. And I, of course, was crushed. But what a what a spectacular basketball game that was back then. So. Yeah, I think you're thinking of the 87 game between Syracuse and Indiana when Keith Smart hit the two-point there jumper you know. to win. All right, good for you. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, I was, you know, listening in the car and, um, you know, I mean, you're you're so enthusiastic and so hopeful and then ah, brushed at the end but right. hey that's that's basketball that's why they yeah. play the games yeah and during this time in radio it was pretty much you had to do everything yourself such as editing time checks transmitter readings uh, and i believe you had to take an fcc test in order to get your license correct that is correct we had um at the time it was not an outrageously difficult exam, but something that I studied for for several weeks because they only gave it a couple of times a year and everybody needed this third class license uh, endorsement in order to work at any station because you had to take these transmitter readings and make adjustments if it was necessary. Um, so I, I, I don't know, studied for three weeks or something, had to go all the way into Boston to, to take the exam and and like any government organization, they eventually they tell you what it is. It comes in the mail like three weeks later. And that was like one of the high points of my youth. And then, uh, you know, later on, I think the only thing you needed was you had, had to sign a postcard that said, I can speak English or a language easily translated into English and sign it, and mail it in. And they, you know, then you were good to go. Because by that time, everything was, you know, pretty much digital and electronic and they didn't have to worry about that too much. Wow. So that was the process in order to get the license renewal where you just had to sign something, mail it back in, and they renewed your license, or did you have to take a shorter, abbreviated I, I, version of the test to renew your SEC license? No, at that point, once you got your license, you had it. You didn't have to take any renewal or anything like that, but they streamlined the entire process. So later on, like in the 80s or by the 80s or early 90s, um, the license requirements for people starting in the business were very, very small. And and it was just a postcard. Like I said, it was, you didn't have to any, there was no math involved. You didn't have to know any history. It was just, uh, yeah, here you go. I want to be on the radio. Wow. <laughs> and then it was up to, uh, you know, the program directors, whoever wanted to, to hire you. Now, so when you first transitioned to that commercial job, what was that transition like going from college to professional and then knowing how streamlined the playlist was? And then I'm sure this was probably pre-automation because a lot of stations at that time really weren't doing cart carousels yet. And it was pretty much where you had to have somebody on deck 24 hours. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, fortunately, the guys who put WJPZ in Syracuse on the air had worked in commercial radio before. So they knew exactly what was necessary and they knew the training that, that we all had to go through. And they wanted to make sure that it was as close to professional commercial station as they could. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, JPZ for just a second, because when I started there, there was a special FCC license waiver where uh, you could put a station on the air as long as it was extremely low power. And by extremely low power, think about this. It, we were licensed at 100 milliwatts. So that's essentially one-tenth of one watt. And a typical light bulb is 60 watts. So, you know, you, a, a light bulb had 600 times the power, you know, in a, in a kind of a general nutshell, as, as our radio station. We could... We didn't really even cover the entire campus. We were very strong in like a couple of dorms. Um, but within a couple of years, the uh, the station management and the, and the new kids that came in um, and the they got some professional guidance, some commercial guidance from, from other people. And now WJPZ is an FM station, still 
very um, uh, very highly formatted, very tightly formatted. They call themselves Z89, and uh, Z89 can be found online. I mean that the the, uh, the station's broadcasting, you know, streaming online, so um, people can check them out themselves. But now they have their own facility and studio, and it's a whole big deal. They, they um, uh, you know, they they're not in the. It's been a long time since they've been in the basement. Right, and also anyway, notice, yeah, and I also noticed during that period, radio stations were very heavy on music surveys because I can remember seeing radio stations print out their top 30, 40, 20, depending on what top songs in that market. And they would have sure. the top songs for that time period along with pictures of the various DJs and the night hours and the day parts in which they would be shifted in. So what was that like going to figuring out, okay, how do we know what we're going to play, when we're going to play it, and how can I add my personality to the shift, even though the playlist is already canned for me? Uh, it was, uh, first of all, I had nothing to do with any of the music, I, uh, nor did I really have any interest in that. That was something that was um, out of my hands, and the program director and music director would do. They generally um, just do the surveys from sales. So, they had all the record stores in the area would give them their raw data of, you know, these are the records that are selling that we've sold the most of this week. And I guess in, uh, in Syracuse, there were about, there were about two to three dozen outlets. So not a, not a whole lot. I mean, you can make 30 or 35 calls a week. You can pretty much nail down, um, you know, what was selling best sometimes they they stuck pretty close to the national sales but not all the time there were there were some you know i can't remember specifics but there were some times where certain records just did really well locally but didn't do very well uh, nationally and that, that's the way it is i think in music all over the place uh, but that was kind of out of my hands they just said here this here's the the music that you're going to play and it was just up to me to figure out, you know, what to say during uh, during individual breaks. You you know, you'd say, well, I, I got to do the weather here, so I'm going to pick out a song with a long intro. Or I've got a lot of business to do here, so pick another song with a long intro. Um, we pretty much had the run of things as far as when we decided to sell certain things or when we decided to say certain stuff. Um, we just had to do it, you know, when I first started off with those within those parameters. There's, here's the music. Say what you want to say over the, you know, over the intros that you have, have available to you. Right. And Later on, that would that would tighten up even more. But at first I had pretty much it was pretty much up to me. Yeah. And that kind of sort of started with the tightening of Jock's Band on there and the playlist back when there was this short-lived format for Top 40 called Hot Hits, which was developed yeah. by Mr. Mike Joseph at 96 yes, Ticks, WTIC right. in Hartford, Connecticut. And then that later led to other stations such as uh, Fire 14. I think that was out of Syracuse, WCAU right. out of Philly. And how it was where jocks are on the air maybe, but this much, and you heard the same four or five songs every hour. And that kind of sort of eliminated the personality in radio, because as a jock, I think you kind of felt confined because, I, hey, I can't really add myself to the presentation because I got to get in, get out before that hot hits jingle package by TM or Pam's comes on. Yeah. Well, th that was interesting because they, because Mike Joseph uh, was hired at WFBL while I was there. Um, it was a, a good story behind that because he, um, we, we got this notice that there was a very important staff meeting on, you know, this day. And I got that memo and I said, I, I'm going to be on vacation because I, I had planned to go to Florida. It was sometime in the winter. I had planned to go to Florida. I wasn't going to change my, my, uh, my vacation plans just to go to a staff meeting. They never told us anything about why they were having it or who's going to be there. And uh, my program director said, well, all right, if you can't be there, you can't be there. So I went away. I come back. My roommates have happened to be two guys who were on the air with me, and um, and I got back to town and they were like, you know, drenched and sweating, <laughs> and I said, "What did I miss?" They said, "Oh gosh, 
And then they went through this whole story about how, you know, this program uh, consultant came in, Mike Joseph, and he's got a very tight uh, format and uh, we don't get to talk very much, but, um, you know, he's had great successes like, you know, 96 ticks or WABC. And um, he said, and, he, and uh, you've got to audition and it's really tough. And he wants all of these things done in this amount of time. Well, fortunately, you know, my, my one roommate took me aside and said, look, here's a hint of the stuff on this list. You don't have to worry about this. It's taken care of with the jingles. You don't have to worry about this because of, you know, this reason, just, um, you know, he, he gave me really kind of a heads up of what I should expect. So I had a mini meeting with Mike Joseph, like 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Then I was sent into the production room to do my audition. And it was going to be, I either pass or I get fired. And fortunately I passed. And so I was one of the guys who was, you know, uh, hired for uh, hot hits in Syracuse. I would disagree that, um, that, whitewashed all of the personality out of things. I think what it did for a lot of us is made us, it certainly made me a much better jock because I got rid of all of the crap that I was saying and just focused on the meat. And so I was still able to do, not only get in all of the information that, that he insisted on, but I did a lot of, I did a lot of comedy. I did a lot of one-liners and, and uh, related to the music, much like I did, you know, prior to that. But, um, I was just, you know, in and out so much faster. So, you know, you give the information, you set up the joke, you give the punchline, bam, there's a jingle and on to the next hot hit. Um, it was very repetitive. We play the number one song every hour around the clock. Uh, often, many of the day parts had some sort of countdown, as you mentioned. It might be the top five records. It might be the top seven records, depending upon, you know, the day part. The whole... The attitude behind that was, you know, we're not going to be a station that they can keep on at work because they'll get so sick of us in two hours because we play all the same music. We want to be the station they go to when they want to hear their favorite song. And so we had a huge queue, a massive queue, but our, our quarter hour maintenance, the, the, the length of time listening, not, not that great. Uh, but that, um, you know, from Syracuse, uh, the the numbers uh, were were quite good for uh, for hot hits in Syracuse, but the station itself was not well run. So they brought in an old general manager who hated rock and roll and changed things over to uh, what they called music of your life, which is a, a essentially music of your grandparents' life, because, I mean, these were hits back in the 20s and 30s. They were, they were we were like, I, we used to joke that we were number one in every funeral part of the town. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, when they went to Music of Your Life, I left them. I went um, back to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I stayed in touch with Mike Joseph. I said, look, if you have anything else coming up, let me know, because I'm just, you know, I'm doing summer filling again at this station that I worked at years ago. And he said, well, stay in touch with me because I think I may have something coming up pretty soon. Okay, great. Um, in the meantime, I had a couple of other offers and uh, for whatever reason, turned them down. Um, one, in fact, was a solid offer in Providence, Rhode Island. And, um, but Joseph said, hang tough. We'll, we'll have an answer for you in like two weeks. So, my mother wasn't real crazy about me hanging out at home because, you know, not turning down a job. But I said, you know, just give me a minute. And um, about two weeks later, that's when he called and he said, look, the station I'm putting on next is in Philadelphia. So jumping from Syracuse, I don't even know what market size it was, but Philadelphia at the time was number four. And that was a that was a massive jump. That was like going from community theater to getting a, you know, a. a a role in a network TV series. So um, again, they brought in a whole bunch of us and they interviewed, I think about two dozen guys. And um, they, we went through the same sort of dry run auditions that they, that we went through in Syracuse. And I don't know, but about six of us made the cut. And thankfully I was one of them. Right. So. And what, 
And was that with uh, Terry Motormouth Young? Because I believe he was at yep, CAU as well. Yep. Uh, when I was uh, when I was interviewing for the job, uh, the general general manager Vince Benedict said, um, "Well, what uh, what day party you're interested in?" I said, "Well, I've done nights." And he said, "No, no, no, I got the night guy covered." And I didn't know who he meant. He said, it's, "He's my secret weapon." And of course, he was talking about Terry uh, Motormouth Young. Uh, let's see. Billy Burke was one of the guys who um, he went on to a, a long radio career, including Los Angeles. Um, Bob Garrett, who is uh, Robert Lawrence, who now is a national programming guru. And I forget what uh, what um, uh, what company he's he's heading up now, but he's he's had tremendous success. Um, Rich Hawkins was one of our guys. I don't know what I'm friends with rich on facebook i can't tell you exactly what he's doing scott walker was our program director and morning man he went on to a great long career not only in philadelphia but then later in tampa um so it was a it was a great launching pad for a lot of guys i mean some some real legends in the business Right. And you mentioned Tampa, and I believe this gentleman, he just recently stepped away from radio. Um, He was working at WCBS, but I'm talking about Mr. Scott Shannon, the man responsible for the morning zoo and revitalizing the top 40 format with what he did at Z100, taking Z100 right. from worst to first. And can we just talk about the impact of what he is meant to radio and what Z100 meant to the top 40 format and giving a shot in the arm that radio really hasn't seen since the days of boss radio, 93 K's J or WABC 66 in New York. Right. The, um, uh, when, when we were going through what we were going through in, in Philadelphia at WCA UFM, uh, a lot of the CBS stations said, wow, they're having big success in, in, uh, in Philadelphia. We could probably do the same thing elsewhere. So they did hire Mike Joseph to put the station on their station on in uh, in Chicago. I think was BBFM, BBM FM, if I remember B correctly. B ninety six. There you go. And all of the uh, all of the CBS stations, the CBS O and Os, started to play top forty. Well, they weren't, uh, you know, they, they weren't doing anything in New York. I mean, New York, which was. Which shocked me but at the time kind of a boring radio market and um this is not to take anything away from scott shannon and his obvious genius uh but uh, you know almost there's a lot of people that could have gone on the air in uh in new york and decided to hey let's just play the hits and they would do well but he had a he had a special personality his his uh his jocks and his staff loved him uh he's a very dynamic person as i'm sure that uh, you know, and once that, once that happened in uh, in New York, and, and granted, the Mike Joseph Hot Hit stations were very tightly formatted, lots of jingles, that burned a lot of people out. But the people always are going to want to hear the hits, and so I think when when Scott did his magic in uh, in New York and did so well. Um, he eventually uh, came out to uh, Los Angeles <clears throat> with his uh, pirate radio. Didn't do quite so well, but he was up against stiffer competition by that time. I think that's one of the reasons why maybe things didn't go quite his way like he would have wanted. Right. And let's talk about your transition out west, where I believe you worked at uh, Hit Radio, which was designed to be a competitor to KISS out of LA right. and then you did work over at uh, Power 106 which was one of the Correct. first groundbreaking stations to give us what we would call churban or rhythmic CHR where you take a little bit of top 40 a little bit of urban give it a top 40 presentation and there you have rhythmic CHR yeah that was uh that was for exciting times too when I when I went to um uh when I left Philadelphia <clears throat> went out to another Mike Joseph station in San Francisco. Uh, the program director at the time that I left was um, a guy named Ed Scarborough, and he was programming the CBS station in St. Louis. He asked me to go to St. Louis, said, you know, you want to come here and do afternoons? Because through some um, uh, unpleasant happenings in Philadelphia, I was moved back to the overnight shift. 
And Ed said, you're, you know, you're an afternoon guy. So come out here to St. Louis, we'll do afternoons. Well, my girlfriend at the time had no interest in going to the Midwest. And so I gently turned him down, ended up going to San Francisco. Ed was promoted to program director in Los Angeles, called me again and said, okay, you didn't want to, you didn't want to be in the Midwest because you're too far from the ocean. Well, I'm really close to the ocean now. Will you come down and work for me? I said, yes, I will. So I went down to Los Angeles, again, playing, playing top 40. It was short-sighted on the part of CBS at the time because KISS FM was so dominant in LA. I mean, they were, they were pulling a 10 share when you could make really good money if you had a three. So they were, they were just, and Rick Dees was on the air in the morning. He was untouchable. So we at KKHR hit radio 93. We had, we had a struggle. We were a good sounding radio station. We had some really talented guys, um, including one of the legends that people look up to Jack Armstrong eventually. Uh, but, um, I don't know. I was there. I was on the year till I was replaced by Jack. And then I went to do, you know, like weekends and fill-ins and, uh, and other things. Power 106 signed on the air. And, uh, I, I was listening to it and I thought, God, they've been on the air for like a weekend. People said, have you heard this new station? So I flipped it on. And to me at the time, it was just disco. I said, what are they doing putting a disco station on the air in Los Angeles? Is this is this a joke? This is gonna this is gonna die. Well, it's shot to the top because, like you said, that that mixture between um, you know, that that churban mixture was just very exciting. I mean, they they did a really nice job, a really nice presentation. I had a friend over there, and, and uh, she said, "Why don't you talk to Jeff Wyatt, the program director?" You know. I think we got a weekend opening coming up. He had, um, uh, he did agree to see me and um, <clears throat> our meeting, frankly, did not go very well. And the reason is that he was programming a station in Philadelphia when I was doing the overnight shift, when I was, you know, I'd gone from at that point mornings to overnights. And my, my presentation was lousy, to be honest with you, because I was, my morale was in the toilet. So he he said to me, you know, I used to listen to you in Philadelphia. Wasn't impressed. I said, I don't blame you. I wasn't very impressed myself when I was working overnight. Uh, he said, all right, well, I'll give you a try. So he put me on on the weekends and um, overnights. And I was thrilled to do it. Um, and then eventually worked my way sort of up from there. I mean, I I think... Not so much anymore, maybe, but that was still at the tail end of the days when the talent would rise to the top and people would, they'd appreciate what you did on the air. They could, after listening for, you know, a few days or weeks, you can tell which people you find entertaining. And for, for whatever reason, I was one of those guys that, you know, they thought, oh yeah, he can handle this. Jay Thomas, who was our morning guy, um, said to uh said to Wyatt look if I go on vacation put Todd Parker on because he's the only one that can handle this and that's not to take away anything from from any of the other talented guys on the radio station but I just I don't know I I, I had a very kind of loose attitude on the air and uh, uh and I guess my personality shone through and so they they liked me filling in for Jay and then Jeff Wyatt, our program director, took himself off the air. So there was an opening there. So he put me on middays for a while. And um, I was a very small part of a very successful machine because we at one time had the largest audience in the country, um, the, the, according to Arbitron. And the the numbers of parties and and uh, and just great stuff that was happening for us was just wonderful. It was a, it was a terrific time to be in radio. Yeah, because listening to old air checks of Power 106 and those power mixes, and especially given the fact that Power 106 reached down to San Diego, you brought in a whole yeah. nother market right there. And with the way that yeah. the station was structured and formatted, it brought to mind of 
the Bay Area Contemporary in uh, 106 Camiel, which had the same flavor and with those mm -hmm. mixes done by the late, great Cameron Paul. Cameron Paul. Yeah. Uh, Camiel was a great station in San Francisco. Uh, I had a, uh, a good friend of mine worked up there. His name is Howard Hoffman. And he really, Howard should have had a much longer radio career. He ended up doing production uh, at K K KABC, which was a talk station in Los Angeles. But he was a very, very talented jock, very talented jock and very talented uh, um, uh, animation actor, too. But he just he he didn't get the shots he probably should have. He was he was one of those guys who was he was so talented, but yet the the business sort of ignored him, which is a shame. But, uh, you know, you brought the uh, brought to mind the power mixes. We had a couple of really talented guys who would who would mix up these tapes uh, that we'd run on the weekends. And gosh, I was on when we ran a lot of those. And they, at the time, they were just these big reels of tape, 12 inch reels of tape. And they'd run for a half hour. But the mixes were just wonderful. And people loved them. And uh, they became a real, a real mainstay, I think, of, of Los Angeles weekend nights. You couldn't go any place without hearing those power mixes, and uh, it, it was a, like I said, a really exciting time. Yeah, and this was back pre-internet, where I'm sure there are probably mail order groups going around and trade magazines like, "Hey, I'll swap you this 98.7 Kiss New York mix by Marley <laughs> Mall and Mr. Magic for this Power 106 mix or this 1580 K Day mix by Dr. Dre, Egyptian Lover." So right. everybody was starting to sample what radio was going on in different markets because back then you necessarily didn't know what was getting played in LA or New York or Houston or Orlando. Right. You, you may have a couple of the same 10 records, but a lot of them varied based on what region of the country you were in. Oh yeah. And, and the, the guys who were doing those mixes and, and, you know, sampling, which of course gave rise to an entire, an entire new DJ industry. Um, the as as new electronic um you know the sampling equipment started to show up and and where you could save stuff instantly digitally and play it back uh you know it it, it spawned an entire uh genre of people that had the talent to like throw all of that stuff together and mix it so beautifully so it just it just is a pleasure to listen to Right. And with hip hop turning 50, I wanted to get your take on what did you think when rap started to come in on top 40 playlists and knowing that a lot of program directors and higher ups were scared of the format and were really only play it when it didn't affect the Arbitron ratings and on mix shows into now where rap is pretty much the number one genre of music in the world. Yeah. And the when it first when raps first started out it was kind of a it was it was sort of a novelty thing it was um you know you had like the sugar hill gang and uh a, a couple of guys that would like throw a few seconds of rap into into the middle of a song um it, it's it started to become a lot more a lot more street a lot more hard uh just about the time that my career was ending and um uh we went from kind of a a, a churban top 40 hybrid of power to it became it became much more of a of a of a harder urban street field to be you know what it is what's what it's become today but that was let's see that was the late 90s i guess is when i finally left there and Asking me what I think about it, or, or or how I how I feel about it, is is probably like asking my grandparents how they felt about rock and roll. It was like, look, this is not my thing, but this is what has captured the uh, the 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 market of the of the youth and the folks that are making the the buying decisions now. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, I think. Just like in any other genre of music and any other given time, there are people that really know what they're doing and there are people that are kind of hacking their way in. Um, but, you know, 
ultimately the uh the people that decide what to listen to and buy the music uh download the music they're going to be the ones that determine who's successful so right right and definitely now with the internet and how the fans and the consumers pretty much have the power to dictate to those in the suits and the suites what we want to hear what we want to see whereas back then they pretty much told you listen to this hear this watch this whereas you dictate to them and it's funny how you mentioned the shift from turban rhythm chr to a more harder urban sound with power 106 hot 97 went through that same phase you know when they first came onto the air they were hot 103 had a dance freestyle rhythmic chr sound i believe howard hoffman was on hot 103 at that time broadway bill lee was on there at that sure. time who just recently got nominated to the radio hall of fame so congratulations broadway bill lee and then when steve oh smith came in around 92 93 for consultant that was when they made their switch from rhythmic chr some more urban, that's where you got your Funk Master Flex, your Angie Martinez, starring Buck Wild, some of the later jots that would come on to gain fame on Hot 97. And the, uh, the you bring up a really good point. The, it used to be, even when, you know, by the 90s or pri immediately prior to the internet, there were gatekeepers. And those gatekeepers decided what was going to get out there. And now, you know, Everybody with a with internet access can listen to whatever the heck they want, and they determine, like you said, they determine the hot artists and the and the and the people that are are um are going to be popular. Uh, the record record companies don't have that kind of power anymore, and I think that that's great. I mean, I was just talking about this to my wife. The uh, the amount of the amount and the number of talented people, ridiculously talented people out there. Um, who ne never would even have gotten a shot years ago if they had to go through the record company mill, um, are developing their own uh, um, their own audiences, and um, you know just just with their internet presence and and YouTube and their own websites, um, you know they're selling out rooms. They might not sell out the Forum in Los Angeles, but uh, or <laughs> or passes for the Forum, but they you know they'll they'll fill a you know, 200 seat theater in, in New York or St. Louis or someplace that they go on tour, their overhead is way lower. They don't have to share, you know, 60% of their gross with the, uh, the record companies. And I think it's, I think it's great for music. I think it's great for music and great for talent. Right. It almost kind of feels like we're kind of resorting back to the days of old with independent labels, do it yourself, almost like how wrestling was before Vince McMahon came in and brought all the regional <laughs> territories out to make WWE the big conglomerate that it is now until AEW is now giving them some heat. But it's to where yeah. you build your buzz, build your fan base, have some units moved, some streams, some likes, some impressions, and then labels will come knock knocking. But you kind of had that back in the 80s with certain rap artists that would do numbers independently in various locales like with Easy e down with McCola and before they signed with Priority with NWA, all the stuff came out of there. MC Hammer out the Bay Area along with Too Short, E40, and just that independent spirit of do it yourself. Why do I need a major when I'm moving units on my own? The only thing you're going to give me is just the reach and more money because I can't move that on my own. But you have right. what I need, and, and, and it's uh, I think it's a lot, a lot better and a lot healthier to put the business decisions, business decisions, back in the hands of the artists. You know why you should compensate the people with the talent and the people that are making music, uh, as opposed to the suits. Mm, I definitely agree. You should definitely be empowered to make the music you want to make not be hesitant to think about, okay, what do the suits say? Do I meet what the shareholders meet and says, I got to meet by a quarter three or quarter four. I want to turn this out, man, when I want to turn it in, not be met by a deadline. But I want to ask yeah. you, what was the point for you that led you to say, I want to get out of the radio and go into narration? <laughs> well, um, it was uh, like a lot of people, I would say most people on the talent side of 
of the business. It, the decision was made for me. Uh, but I'll back up by saying that the in smaller markets like Syracuse, most every market in the country, anybody who wanted to do commercials, they always hired the district. When you get into towns the size of New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, it's not necessarily the case. So I've been doing commercials all over the country. And when I got to Los Angeles, all of a sudden, nobody was opening doors because I sounded too much like a disc jockey. Well, I was. Um, they said, you've got to go to uh, some voiceover workshops and acting workshops and, and be able to, to sound more natural and, um, and not so much like a, like a jock. I said, okay, I can do that. So that was sort of underway for, oh, I don't know, five or six years, seven years. And then one day at Power 106, my, for my money, the best program director I've ever worked for, his name is Jeff Wyatt. He was the one that was responsible for Power 106's success. He was 100% uh, behind his talent, uh, was just a great cheerleader for us and kept our morale high, and he was just great. He left. He actually went over to Kiss FM. He was replaced by his boss at uh, at Emmis, uh, Rick Cummings, and Rick never really cared for me. <laughs> so um, he brought me into his office not long after he got there when the station he was going to take the station in a different direction. And he sat me down and he said, you know, Todd, you're just too old and too white to work here anymore. And I thought to myself, wow, there's two lawsuits right there. But I realized he's actually, he's casting a show and, and he was right. I mean, he was going after people that were spending their nights at raves. Well, I don't know. I guess I was in my early forties by that time. I wasn't going to spend my night at, nights at raves. It was it was time to go. Power had passed me by. So I said, thank you very much. I walked out. I took my headphones with me. Never looked back. I. Uh, it surprises me even now because radio was in my blood and I, I ate, slept, bled radio. But when I walked out of power for the last time, I figured I've got a voiceover career. I can continue to do these these commercials and and you know, pretty much match my salary. Well, voiceovers is acting just like, um, oh, just like acting on a television or a series or a movie. I mean, you've got to audition for parts. They're going to hire you based on, you know, whether they like you or they don't. So it's not exactly an easy business to get into or to stay into. But there were enough different parts of it that I, I explored a lot of things. I did some animation stuff. I did a lot of backgrounds in television and film, um, uh, promos and narrations for like the History Channel and A&E, and, um, and then got into uh, audiobooks as well. So there were enough little things where I could kind of go through and, you know, pick the low hanging fruit and keep the wolves away from the door. Um, one of the things that uh, that was lovely is that now I'm no longer, you know, a, a sort of at the mercy of the ratings. And if I can develop some kind of customer base where I have the same clients coming back to me again and again, I got enough of those to, uh, you know, to do okay. And for whatever reason, some audio uh, audiobook publishers and um, you know talent people thought I was doing good work there. So most of my work now is uh, is audiobooks. And as you can look around my palatial studio here, that's so cleverly disguised as a walk-in closet, uh, my commute is down to like four steps from bed. So uh, I'm actually pretty happy. During the uh, during the pandemic, when everybody was locked inside. I was like, so this is, I, I've been doing this for years. <laughs> this, this is, this is no different for me. I'm perfectly fine. Perfectly happy. So. Right. So being in the voiceover narration business, is it more likely for you to go in as a higher gun where you go independently or is it primarily where you have to get represented by a major 
house to kind of find work for you as opposed to being independent and going on your own? I think you can do it either way. However, if you get involved with an agency, a voiceover agent um, that believes in you and is fighting for you, you're going to get more chances at bigger jobs. Um, the what I'm doing now, the the uh, primarily the voiceover, uh, I'm primarily the audiobook route, as well as dealing with some of my, my old clients directly. Um, I don't have to worry about that so much, or I don't worry about that so much. The um, as radio changed, where you know you have now, it's so much of it is automated, and and uh, and people are dealing with computers. Uh, in the studio, as they had for the past couple of decades, rather than racks of carts and other things, um, the uh, the amount of advertising has dropped, or the budgets have dropped. So, from my friends who are working in the voiceover business and continuing to audition, they've almost all said it's changed so much now. It's a lot harder to get those those uh those big big clients and big commercials and so for me it's a lot it's been a lot better just to go independent and deal with people uh directly it's three o'clock rather than going through um through a voice agent um i think that you know the, the voice agents that are operational and the people that are working there and working through them are are happy that they have representation, but uh, I think you can do it without it as well, particularly yeah. now that we have the internet and, and so many other, uh, um, I, I guess, areas where we can promote ourselves. Right, it's definitely a great age to do it yourself, be independent, and that was one of the things that Prince was very big on in his career where he really embraced the internet when everybody was scared of it, you know, selling emancipation and crystal ball on mpg.com and right. how it took Napster, mp3.com and a lot of these peer to peer sites to mm -hmm. have that music industry realize, Hey, we're not going to be having everybody go to FYE, Suncoast, Tower, The Wiz, Camelot, by 1999 CDs anymore. And I feel that the movie industry is going through that same shift that the music industry went through two decades ago where people are not going to go to the theaters. Whereas if I could just stream it from my house, I got surround sound, buy my own snacks. Why do I need to go to a movie movie theater to pay X amount of money for the ticket to benefit you in the movie studio? Yeah, I agreed. I think that, um, and a lot of people, that's, that's, I still like to go to the theater once in a while because just because of the experience, not because of, uh, uh, you know, not because it, I can't get it at home, but sometimes you just want to go and get those big cushy seats. And maybe some of the theaters now they have waiters and waitresses that come around and bring you stuff. And that, that's kind of fun once in a while, but because so many people, um, they, they stream their, their movies at home. I think you get a lot more people like talking in the theater because they're used to talking at home during the movie, and that's kind of annoying. But um, yeah, I, with the with the, uh, the television screens that people have now, and these huge TVs, and the, and it's you know the the uh, the digital surround sound systems are not very expensive anymore, and so people can essentially have the theater experience in their living room, and and that's that's pretty great. Uh, it does put a little bit of pressure on the um, on the studios. Because they, you know, they they're all trying to crank out these huge blockbusters that they can, you know, cram the the, the people into the theaters here and then sell around the world. So you don't get um, as many fun little films as you used to as you used to get maybe. But um, you know, I think there'll be a lot more uh, independent producers and directors, and uh, you can, you know, with the ability to to shoot so much, even on your cell phone now, and certainly, you know, a lot less expensive, high definition, portable cameras. It opens up, um, you know, a movie career to a lot more people. 
Right. And with all of the various streaming services and platforms, we have room for other stories that wouldn't get made by a major studio 20, 30 years yeah. ago. I mean, look at everything everywhere all at once that just really swept the Oscars and how Kehu Kwan went from playing short round in Indiana Jones to data from the <laughs> right. Goonies and Encino Man yeah. winning an Oscar is just now leveling the playing field where it's like, I don't have to go to you to get my stuff made. I could just go yeah. direct to consumer, put it on Netflix, Hulu, or whatever streaming service of my choice, and I'm going to find my own audience instead of trying to play to the least common denominator. And I want to give your take on vinyl outselling all other mediums, and it's making a comeback because with a lot of the younger generation, they want to rediscover that crisp, crackling warmth of analog, and I say that loosely because they're converting digital to analog. You're not going to get the same feel right. from real analog unless you're recording in a real studio with Ampex reel-to-reels and you're going from live to tape, and how mm -hmm. Walkmans are going on eBay for about 300 bucks if this, you could find one in good working condition. I feel old as dirt because I came in at the tail end of vinyl, grew up with Walkmans, recording off the radio. So I kind of got that yep. last bit of the tail end of the analog era and saw the birth of the digital era in real time going on. Napster, LimeWire, BearShare, Kaza. I did not burn any CDs, by the way, so don't come look for me, RIAA. Well, I think that... Um... Uh, it's up to the individual about what they feel sounds best. Uh, it still surprises me that uh, vinyl is so popular because it's it's kind of a fragile medium. I mean, the 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 cracks and pops and and scratches that show up on uh, on vinyl records. Um, I, I don't know. I guess you get that you're compensated by the maybe the warmth of the sound, uh, or maybe it's just that my ears aren't particularly uh, 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 sensitive to some of that stuff. I can't. I can't necessarily hear a big enough difference. Uh, I remember when um, uh, a lot of stations were going. You know, they they it would seem like a, a selling point in radio to say we're all CD and and you know you'll 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 hear the quality difference well my chief engineer snorfed at that because he said look the the dynamic range of a cd you know might be from here to here but the dynamic range of fm is just like here so it doesn't matter the quality of the source you're not going to hear all of the highs and all of the lows because Broadcasting is just, it, it. you're not able to get that entire dynamic range broadcast over the air. Now, it's not like anybody, unless you're a real audiophile, is going to be able to notice. Um, but I, I just thought that that was kind of laughable. I guess there's, uh, again, a, a little bit more uh, dynamic range on, on some of the vinyl, but um, I can't hear it if, you know, enough people are buying it that's great i mean anything to get uh, to get more money into the hands of the artists as far as i'm concerned right and um i want to get your take on what this man meant to radio meant to tv meant to pop culture and especially this little show that played the hits from coast to coast you know who i'm talking about the late great Casey Kasem and American yes. Top 40, which is now done by Mr. Ryan Seacrest, who I feel is this right. generation's Dick Clark. Yeah, that's true. And um, Ryan, I've got a tremendous amount of respect for him. I, I, I don't know the man. I've never met the guy. But people who uh, worked with him when he was coming up through the ranks in radio, uh, like at KISS FM, would say that he was on the phone constantly. He was always he was always making deals with somebody or something. It was like he never stopped working. So as far as I'm concerned, completely uh, deserves every bit of success that he has. Uh, as far as Casey is concerned, I heard him for the first time. I think the very first AT40 show, I want to say it was back in maybe, I don't know, 1970. Maybe you know better than I, but it was a... Uh, um, 
July 4th weekend. And um, uh, I, I was driving back from Cape Cod in Massachusetts and had the radio on. And I thought, first of all, I heard the guy's voice. He's got this high squeaky voice. It's, it's not like he's got a voice for radio necessarily, but he's one of those guys that is just so listenable. I mean, he, he was really talking to you as opposed to talking at you. And it was almost impossible to turn away. He was, he was just very, very compelling. Um, was a huge fan of AT40 and used to listen to it every week at whatever radio station. When I was on the air at that Portsmouth, New Hampshire station, I told you about, I would, I would um, uh, engineer his show. Uh, he ran, it was three hours. And at the time it was on vinyl. I mean, they would, they would record the show, press it onto vinyl and ship these albums out all over the country uh, for the following weekend. Um, I had a chance to meet him once uh a very kind sweet man um didn't spend a lot of time with him but but he was very present and and uh um you know he was a big star at the time could have blown me off but he didn't uh, um so i i've got a very very warm feeling about casey right and um what was your take when you first heard and saw mtv for the first time and how when this new medium came onto the air it completely flipped the music industry on its head. And like the Bogle said, video did kill the radio star because it was all about look. And it's heightened even more so now because of social media, but MTV was really the first wave of that. Yeah, it was. And it, I think it made a huge splash and made a lot of people nervous. And I think the, uh, the immediate effect was that <clears throat> all of a sudden you went from artists being really talented musically to now they also had a they had to have a really good look so you know you had a bunch of uh, a bunch of girl bands pop up like the bangles and the go-go's you know beautiful women who could play their instruments or duran duran you know guys who were the teenage girls just loved who musically maybe not so great but uh, who became you know icons to that uh, generation but although, uh, you know, the, the video killed the radio star was something that was um, worried about and people were taking very seriously. Ultimately, music radio lasted a, a whole lot longer than, uh, than videos. I mean, even MTV went from playing virtually 100% music videos to whatever they are now. I mean, they, they've got shows all over the road, but I can't. Gosh, I can't remember the last time I saw, uh, you know, more than one or two videos in a row. Right. It was definitely right around that time period where MTV wasn't really available everywhere else because cable was brand new. So you had NBC with Friday night videos. You had USA yeah, Network true. with Night Flight. And some of the other independent stations would have their own localized music video shows playing music from pop, rock, rap. R&B, and then you had BT oh. came out in 80, VH1 came out in 85, and that pretty much spread the gamut to say, hey, we're going to put AC artists here. We're going to put urban artists here, although, of course, MTV yeah. was top 40 AOR, and how it wasn't right. until Walter Yetnikoff called MTV and said, I'm going to pull every single video from CBS Epic Records unless you play Michael Jackson, and that officially broke through the color barrier at MTV because they weren't really playing black artist videos. And there's an infamous interview from, I believe, 82 or 83, when David Bowie was grilling Mark Goodman about MTV's lack of playing black artists. And of course, Mark gave the company line, like, well, you know, we cater to this particular demographic in the Midwest who may be afraid of Prince. And how when I interviewed, you know, T.C. Tompkins, who worked in radio promo, for Epic, he was responsible for breaking Sade in the U.S. and how he was explaining to her, this is how the game is played in America. Whereas over in Europe, you pretty much play everything on BBC One or Capital Radio in its free form. Whereas here, we're pretty much segregated based on formats, and we kind of all know the origins of that. Look at your history books before they burn them. Fahrenheit 451. Yeah. They uh, that was a fascinating interview, by the way, that uh, that you did with TCT. It was it was a lot of fun to see. Um, the, 
the fact that um, they thought that the Midwest was not going to be interested in Prince or Michael Jackson is just it's so laughable to me. Or you know, it, it would be like saying, "Oh, we can't play Bruno Mars because uh, he's 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 a black guy." Well, he's an awesome musician. I, I he has he has the kind of range as far as I'm concerned. Like um. Oh, like like Michael Jackson or like like Billy Joel. He 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 seems to be so versatile as being able to go from from just great ballads to just rock and stuff and everything in between. You unique little niche stuff that he can make sound great. And um, that's to me, that's so short sighted. But again, I think that's that's what we're seeing um, with so many of these artists being available on uh, online now and streaming services and YouTube. They, you know, the, the only thing they care about is, is this person entertaining? Is this a good song? You know, does it uh, can I dance with it or uh, can I ride my bike to it or can I jog to it? Um, or is it is it great to have on when I'm housekeeping I and mean, whatever it is? Right. It reminds me of, like I was saying earlier, how because of the internet's making the world smaller, how uh, everybody is more accepting and tolerated of people from various different backgrounds and say, hey, you don't have to do this to appeal to us. Just be yourself. I mean, look at Bad Bunny in the big year that he's had, and he didn't <laughs> have to record an English language album to do it, whereas that was the strategy back in the day for artists of Latin descent where you would have to record an English language album in order to cross over to the U.S. market. Not so anymore. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> or, you know, back in, gosh, 50s and 60s, where you might have, uh, you know, a, a, an artist with a hit record, they bring you in to do a Spanish version uh, because they didn't think that that uh, it would sell otherwise and, you know, in in some of the neighborhoods. Well, that's yeah, that's ridiculous. I mean, people are gonna people are gonna like what they like. Yeah, uh, you know? I I agree. And the last yeah yeah. And the last question I want to get you out of here on is where do you see radio going? We all know that streaming and with the internet, it made radio not have the power that it once had pre-internet. But how does it find its place? in the digital streaming age. Oh, Jarrell, I'm going to really disappoint you here because I haven't a freaking clue. Uh, I have been so... I tried my hand at, at being a PD early in my career and just, I was awful at it because I didn't have, I didn't have the, the insight or the ability to, to see what the next thing that was coming is. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what... Um, what where radio is going to go to me it's like this is people this is for people who are too lazy to to download spotify it's like they want to hear some music so they they flip the knob on um i i think there's a lot of listening in uh obviously a lot of listening in cars during commute times <clears throat> but even that people are much more apt to if there's if there are long commercial breaks which i was heading down to, to uh San Diego with my wife the other day and listening to some station. And I think they had, I lost count at like 18 commercials in a row. Oh, I mean, 18 it was this commercials in a stop set? Stop set, yes. And I thought, what are they doing? They're loading up all the commercials at once so then they can play music for the rest of the hour? I didn't get it. It, it uh, After a while, I mean, I just kept the station on so I could continue counting. But um, if I was just listening, I wouldn't have made it past you know, commercial number three. Um, and maybe they were counting on that. Maybe they were counting on people going someplace else. And then when that station puts commercials on, they would come back. But um, to me, it seemed rather, I don't know, rather short-sighted. But there are people that are going to keep it on during the car for traffic reports and weather and news and that type of stuff. And But I think if they really want to hear their favorite songs, they've got their, everybody's got their phones. And um, so I'm not sure I think a lot of uh, a lot of investors that paid way way too much money for broadcast uh, stations, say in the '80s and '90s, are struggling now. I mean, to, to make that debt. I may be totally wrong. I just don't know. But I haven't any idea. 
Yeah, you know I mean? it's, it's, any, it's anybody's guess at this point. So do you have any thank yous you want to give before we conclude this interview? And also, where can people get a hold of you if they want to try to get you for some narrations and voiceover work? <laughs> well, um, my uh, my email address is Todd McLaren, T-O-D-D-M-C-L-A-R-E-N, like the car. Uh, I, am, uh, I am related to them. I'm just not close enough to do me any good. So it's Todd McLaren 2022 at Gmail. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, I, I don't even have a website at this point because I haven't needed it for so long. And I'm sort of, I'm on the tail end of my career. So I'm, I'm backing off from doing a lot of this stuff. Um, thank yous. Let's see. I'll, I'll go down kind of a, a off the top of my head list of people that uh, I know and love and that have helped me out. Uh, Norm Nathan, who really sort of got me started. Uh, Mike Joseph, who made me a much better jock, even though I was confined to a maximum of 10 seconds of talk time per break. Um, Ed Scarborough, who brought me down to Los Angeles, uh, some, got me into Hollywood for the first time. Best program director I ever had was Jeff Wyatt. And you mentioned his name earlier. Uh, the most entertaining guy on the radio today, and frankly, ever for my money, is Bill Lee. Uh, when he he was on the air in San Francisco on KFRC. I would get off the air at KITS 96, I mean, uh, KITS 105. And I would rush to my car and turn on KFRC so I wouldn't miss a break of Bill Lee when I, uh, when I drove home. And I still, I still love punching him up on, uh, uh, online and, and catching his breaks on CBS FM because he's just, he's wonderful. And that kind of entertainer, radio is really sorely lacking on. But they used to be there used to be a lot more of them. But uh, I think that because of the basic changes in radio and and uh, we're just not developing that kind of talent anymore. No. Nope. And Jarell, I'd like to thank you. No, I I thank you for taking the time out to do this interview. Is that era, jocks like yourself, Broadway Bill Lee, Donnie Simpson, Wall Baby Love, Scott Shannon, Kid Kelly, Casey Kasem, and the list goes on and on that inspire me to do what I do. And you can catch this interview wherever you stream podcasts and on YouTube at youtube.com slash beyond the album cover. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big thank you and round of applause for Mr. Todd McLaren for coming on to Beyond the Album Cover. Thank you once again, Todd. Thank you, Gerald. Yes, sir.